So today we're going to review the treatment of sickle cell anemia. Uh, here's some background pharmacology concepts that you're going to need to be able to define. And actually this lecture will help you define um, these, which will help you consolidate some of your knowledge and understanding of pharmacology basic concepts. The locations where the learning objectives, which are listed here, are um, described are going to be signified by this, this blue box. And so wherever you see this blue box um, throughout this presentation, that will tell you which, um, which slides or which information is going to satisfy these learning objectives. All right. So for the treatment of sickle cell anemia, it's really relatively easy. We're really only dealing with one drug. And so this, this drug, hydroxyurea, um, is really the sole approved drug for the treatment of sickle cell anemia. And the reason this is so is because we've, we've got evidence-based medicine that tells us that patients with sickle cell anemia uh, had longer 10-year survival rates if they were treated with hydroxyurea. Uh, overall, or moreover, this, this drug reduces the number of pain episodes, as well as reduces the risk for coronary syndromes. Um, it is an old drug. It was originally used uh, to treat cancer. It was an anti-cancer drug uh, for CML. And um, really, this relatively simple genetic mutation that produces sickle cell anemia has this really complicated pathophysiology outcome. So many of the clinical concerns in terms of your patient are actually complications of sickle cell anemia. And so outside of treatment of pain relief, renal failure, and some of these other problems that are listed here, hydroxyurea is really going to be the only drug that's actually going to treat the, the disease outcome of sickle cell anemia. And we'll talk about how that actually works in the upcoming lectures. So first and foremost, um, I want you to know how hydroxyurea works. And the reason it does work is because it has a very specific mechanism of action. And let's back up even further and say, well, what is the mechanism of action? So the, clinically, um, the mechanism of action is the way in which any drug works. Okay, and so here's an example. Drug X binds to receptor Y and produces some type of physiologic change through activation or, or inhibition of a specific enzyme or a specific receptor. Uh, this is not to be confused with clinical indication or just indication, um, which is really just the use. So what is the drug used for? So this drug is used for hypertension. This drug is used for AIDS or di uh, diabetes. Uh, this drug is used for cancer. Um, so that's one clear difference between mechanism of action and indication. And, and of course, uh, this satisfies learning objective one. So hydroxyurea actually has three mechanisms of action. Um, the first is that it's a ribonucleotide reductase inhibitor. All right. And so what this means or what this translates to is it's really going to affect the rate limiting step to DNA synthesis. It also chelates iron, which is an important cofactor for many biological functions. And it actually has a specific anti-cycling activity, and that comes from the induction of fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin F through its activation of a specific gene promoter. And so these individual mechanisms are portrayed in the next few slides. So there is a um, graphic depiction of what mechanism of action one looks like. So of course, to make DNA, you've got purines and pyrimidines, and these get incorporated into ribonucleotides. And then this becomes deoxyribonucleotides, okay, through this enzyme ribonucleotide reductase, okay? So hydroxyurea, which is shown here, actually inhibits this ribonucleotide reductase, which converts ribonucleotides into deoxyribonucleotides. What does that mean for the organism or for the cell? Well, less DNA, all right? Because we're inhibiting this rate-limiting step for DNA incorporation. So this is learning objective one still. The second mechanism of action um, note that sickle cell patients uh, often require blood transfusion, and then the outcome, the clinical outcome, is going to be iron overload. And so when you add hydroxyurea uh, to these blood transfusion regimens, um, the outcome is going to be kind of reduced uh, or, or normalized iron levels, because remember, all that extra iron that's, um, that's found within this transfusion is going to be chelated and soaked up by this hydroxyurea compound. So that's the second mechanism of action. And of course, the third mechanism has to do with the induction of fetal hemoglobin. 
Okay, and so uh, basically when you when you increase the number and the amount of fetal hemoglobin uh, positive erythrocytes, you're going to lead to less um, sludging and less less accumulation of clots. Uh, that's going to um, reduce the uh, amount of vascular damage, and also reduce the uh, frequency and the incidences of pain. And so then the outcome is going to be, you know, of course, longer lifespan of the red blood cell, more normal levels of nitric oxide, and then normal levels of hemoglobin, um, which is, you know, beneficial for these patients. Also note that other drugs have the ability to induce fetal hemoglobin, and those are listed here. And of course, the way in which this occurs basically is uh, summarized here. Basically, you have, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to move it. Basically, you have um, this promoter being turned on by the use of hydroxyurea. Um, and so what happens is that once this promoter is turned on, you induce the, the F cell uh, phenotype production. Okay, and that comes from uh, the production of more soluble guanylyl cyclase. So the outcome here, you've got more red blood cells with higher levels of fetal hemoglobin um, than the untreated group. And so this is now the, the third mechanism of action of uh, hydroxyurea. Let me move this back. So again, uh, the clinical outcome is going to be less sludging, less vasoocclusions, occlusions, um, and then less vascular damage. And so these are three different um, mechanistic pathways as to how this particular drug works. Uh, the clinical indications for hydroxyurea um, are stated here. Uh, and basically, it's, you know, re remind yourself that treatment under um, hydroxyurea is really the clinical standard for kind of preventing those painful crises that, that develop in these patients. Um, and of course, hydroxyurea has also been used in the treatment of cancer and other um, conditions which are, which are listed here as well. And so in terms of pharmacology, hydroxyurea um, has really good oral absorption, and it can be given IV, okay? Uh, the peak plasma concentration is anywhere from one to four hours. Volume and distribution uh, translates to total body water, uh, and a lot of it really concentrates in the leukocytes and the erythrocytes. This drug is biotransformed. 60% uh, of a dose is, is transformed or metabolized by the liver, and the other 40% um, by various other enzymes throughout the body. 40% um, of that dose also undergoes renal elimination. So assuming the patient's kidneys are optimally working, uh, you can give them the, the, the standard adult dose, which was 15 milligrams per kilogram. Note in the patients that have renal insufficiency, you would give a dose reduction. Uh, this particular drug is also S phase specific, and we'll define what that S phase is in the next upcoming um, segment of this talk.